Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord, saints. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm just grateful to God this morning. Hallelujah. I appreciate him because he has been good to me. Hallelujah. Just like the song says, sometimes I sit up and I just think about all the things that he's done for me, where he's brought me from. I think about his goodness and his mercy and his long suffering with me. Hallelujah. Because there were times I was just slothful. Hallelujah. There was times where I just heard and didn't hear. Amen. Hallelujah. But I thank God because he was merciful on me, for me, and he kept, he kept drawing me. He kept drawing me by his spirit. And he kept telling me to trust him. There was times, hallelujah, when I may not have understood things, but God said, trust me. Hallelujah. And I thank him that he's beginning to, to uh, wake me up in the mornings. Hallelujah. And my first desire, my heart's desire is to go and spend time with him. Hallelujah. And to hear from his, his voice, to hear him tell me, hallelujah, to order my day. Hallelujah. To give me wisdom and understanding and the things that, things of God, hallelujah, to, uh, to get into his word and to understand, to try to understand his word, hallelujah. And I'm grateful for that, hallelujah, because there was times when although I knew I should have been going before him, I know I should have been in my word, hallelujah. There was times where I was just too slowful to do it, hallelujah. But he began to, hallelujah, to impress upon me the importance, hallelujah, of allowing him to be first in my life, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I thank him, I'm grateful, hallelujah, because he's drawing me by his spirit. He's given me understanding of his word, hallelujah, a deeper love for his word and a deeper love for him, hallelujah, Lord God. And I'm grateful for what he's doing in my life, and I thank him, hallelujah, I give him praise, I give him glory, in Jesus' name, I pray. Y'all keep praying my strength in the Lord, amen. From a question that praise Sister Tasha the asked Jesus. on last week, what does it mean to crucify the flesh? And I don't know if you guys remember the question, praise God, and if you had an opportunity to go home and to, to pray about it, to seek God about it, to study about it. But you guys know that, Brother Ken, my mind and my heart, praise God, is for you to know and to understand as much as God will reveal unto you concerning his word. Amen? I'm really uh, a stickler for that scripture over in Hosea chapter 4 and verse number 6 where the Lord says that my people are being destroyed for lack of knowledge. And we're finding that to be the case uh, so many times, so many times. And I want you to know this, for those who don't understand, for those who do have a lack of knowledge, the lack of knowledge is something that you can overcome. Amen. And I know that some people feel like, I don't know, I've never been to school or don't have a degree, don't read well. That is not a mountain that cannot be overcome. Can you hear me today? Can't read well is not a mountain that cannot be overcome, especially with the, uh, with the advent of all of these uh, audio aids, uh, the Bible on audio. Praise God. Amen. You guys can watch movies, can't you? <laughs> you, can, you, you can watch. Amen. There's, 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 there, are too many, there are too many aids available to us for us to use, I didn't know, as an excuse for not doing the will of God. It's just, it's just too much available, amen? So we want to overcome in every opportunity that we can. We want to overcome uh, a lack of knowledge, okay? Today we're going to talk about what does it mean to crucify the flesh. The word crucify, when you look at uh, that word crucify, and this is taken from, uh, from the original Greek, uh, which is very, it, it lines up pretty closely with what uh, the, the regular dictionary says, uh, with, with a few exceptions. To crucify means to bring something to death. It means to take life away from something. It means to mortify or to subdue. It means, and this is, this is the part of the definition that I found to be more uh, applicable for our situation as children of God. It means to destroy the power or the influence of something. To destroy the power or the influence of something. And uh, I, I like that particular part of the definition because if you read in the Bible, the Bible says that those who crucified Christ, they thought that when they, when they did so, 
they really thought that they had destroyed his power and that, that, that they had destroyed his influence in the lives of those who followed him. But they just didn't know <laughs> that when they crucified him, his influence expanded, amen? Many of those who were, who were followers of Christ, I mean, a lot of, them, a lot of them fled, a lot of them got scared because that they were gonna be killed also. But so many of them, as they scattered from one place to another place in the earth, they took their teachings along with them. Are y'all hearing me today? Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8, Paul says this. Paul says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If they had just known and just realized, praise God, what they were doing. If they, if they had seen the end, they never would have put him on that cross. Praise God. Anybody ever make any bad investments in something? You bought some land and you shouldn't have. You put some money in a stock or in a mutual fund and you shouldn't have. You put, you put, you put your heart in a marriage and it didn't work out. Shouldn't have. <laughs> those, are, those are bad investments, amen? If you knew when you were going into that thing, if you knew going in what you knew coming out, you would do things a whole lot differently, would you? Yes, yes, yes. And this is what the scripture is saying, that if, the, if those people who killed Christ knew going into the hanging him on that cross, if they knew that he would just, that him going away would open up the door for the Holy Ghost to be poured out into, into a whole lot of people. If they had known that, if they had believed that, then they would not have crucified him. Amen? Amen? Now, we're talking about what does it mean to crucify the flesh? And this is very important for your understanding. Because when you're reading in the scriptures, you're going to find that the term the flesh has two distinct meanings or two distinct applications. Now, especially in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, I didn't find really any, any passages except for a few where the prophets may have been prophesying about something to happen in the flesh after the coming of Jesus Christ. But for the most part, in the Old Testament, it had a different connotation from what you read about and what you see in the New Testament. Now, in a natural sense, which is what you see mostly in the Old Testament, you're going to see what the, the, the term flesh means the soft substance that's used to cover the internal extremities, your legs and your limbs, your arms, and so, and so forth, of both man and beast. In short terms, it's talking about skin. Okay? Flesh, in a natural sense, is talking about skin. But when the Bible speaks about crucifying the flesh, He's not talking about crucifying your skin. Okay? I need, to make this, I need to make this perfectly clear to you. He's talking about something different. When the Bible speaks about crucifying the flesh, he's talking about, uh, in a spiritual sense, talking about man's animal nature that drives, it incites, it provokes, and it even encourages him to sin. Okay? In a, in a spiritual sense, when the Bible speaks about the flesh, he speaks about uh, the earthly nature of a man minus God's divine influence. Talking about a carnal mind, okay? Minus God's divine influence. God's influence, praise God, uh, is, that th is what directs, it's what leads us and guides us. God's influence is the Holy Ghost. Can y'all say amen to that? Praise God. Jesus began to speak and he said, he said, if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. He said, but if I go away, then and if the, when the comforter comes, then he is going to lead you and guide you into all truth. Okay? Him leading us is God's influence in our lives. Can, can y'all agree to that? Praise God. So, he, and, and in short terms, it's the carnal mind. And I know you guys have heard that term before. Now, in Romans chapter 8 and verse number 12 and 13, it says this. He says, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, 
not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. Okay, now I'm, gonna, I'm going to solicit some, some participation from y'all this morning. So y'all got the mask up, pray y'all just pull them down for a minute. Because <laughs> I'm going to be asking for some interaction this morning, amen? amen? Amen. When you see that term debtor, somebody tell me what does that term mean? What is a debtor? Someone that owes something. Someone that owes a debt. It could be a debt you owe to the credit card company. It could be a debt you owe to BTU. It could be a debt you owe to Sudden Link. It could be a, it, any kind of debt is, what he's, is, is a debtor, okay? So he says, therefore, brethren, we don't owe anything to the flesh. Are y'all hearing me? This is what he's saying. He said, we are not debtors, not to the flesh, we're not debtors to the flesh. Why? Because the flesh didn't do anything good for us. What has the flesh done good for you? Nothing at all. The flesh, praise God, in that spiritual sense, the one that drove me, the flesh is, the, is what led me to want to go out there and get drunk on a Friday and Saturday night. Amen. Hallelujah. So he says, therefore, we are debtors. Now, we're not debtors to the flesh, but we do owe a debt to who? We owe a debt to Christ, don't we? Amen. Hallelujah. So he said, we are debtors. Yes, and he's not saying that we aren't, but we're not debtors to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. So in this reference, y'all give me, give me a little feedback here. What is, he, what is he talking about? If you live after the flesh, you shall die. What is he talking about? What does he mean by if you live after the flesh, you're going to die? Y'all, wait, 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 wait. Now, I gave all y'all a chance to talk. And she started talking, and all y'all want to chime in. What kind of decorum is that? <laughs> gave y'all a chance to talk. And you wait till she get halfway into her statement, and then all oh, got chicka choppy, chicka 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 chong over here. <laughs> Come on. Back up. Back up. Back up with that. Come on, Sister Faye. One at a time. Paul said we can all, we can all, he said we prophesy by course, which means one at a time. He said we can all sing together, <laughs> but we can't, we're not, we're not all prophesying at the same time, okay? So we're going to let Sister Faye prophesy. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on, Sister Faye. <laughs> Okay, but what does it mean to die? What, what, does, it, what does it mean to die? Does, does it, what does that mean to die? Come on, Sister Gertrude, you was chiming earlier. Come on with it. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> I don't want an example on what Sister Faye said. What does it mean to die? <laughs> okay, come on. <laughs> I gotta watch y'all, boy. Y'all some y'all slick with these answers, boy. I I heard you last Wednesday night. I wanna I wanna piggyback on so on what she said. No, we ain't piggybacking, praise God. <laughs> and we're not live streaming, so you so you say. Go go ahead. <laughs> Okay. God and came into your life and changed you. Are you just not in that flesh? You won't react. You okay. Won't. That part of you is dead. Dead. Amen. All right. All right. Come on, give Sister Gertrude a hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Tell her, get off that pig's back. <laughs> <laughs> he said, for if you live after the flesh, if you live after the flesh, if the flesh is dictating how you live, if the flesh is dictating how you think, if the flesh is dictating, 
your actions and your conduct and your behavior, he said, you're going to die. Now, he's not talking about natural death there, okay? He's not talking about, because we're all going to die natural death anyway. When he spoke to Adam in, in the garden and told him, the day you eat of the fruit of this tree, you shall surely die, he was talking about natural death. And in Adam's case, he was also talking about spirit death, separation from God. Yes, 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 yes. Hallelujah. God, God banned them, e rejected them. What's the word I want to say? Evicted them. That's the word. He evicted them from the garden, okay? But in, our, in this scripture's case, he's saying that if we live after the flesh, if I, if I get this notion in my mind to do something and I know it's not the will of God, and if I do it, like Sister Gertrude said, if I do it anyway, then I am putting myself in a place, in a position to where well, if I did have a relationship with God, I'm putting that relationship in jeopardy. Yes. Yes. I'm putting that relationship, we, we might have we been close like this, but what is it that separates us from God? Sin. Sin. So if I follow after the desires of the flesh, every time I do it, that separation just gets wider and wider and wider. Yes. Now, I don't know about you guys during the, 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 during the, 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 the meat so, of the summer. We didn't have we no rain. But we understand that living after the flesh, pray God, even in those situations, and I heard Bishop T.D. Jakes make this statement a long time ago. He said, I used to think the anointing was, was, good, was good music and a, and, a, and a good feeling when I went to church. And a lot of folks still believe that. A lot of people still think that it's, the anointing is just good music and a good feeling. He said, until I went to an Aretha Franklin concert, and I had the same feeling when I went to her concert. You can feel good and you can enjoy any kind of music. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the anointing of God in that music. Are y'all hearing me today? So he said, but if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. There's going to be a greater separation between you and God. He said, but if you, through the Spirit, through what? The Spirit. Through what? The Spirit. We need the Holy Ghost, y'all. Yes, yes, we need the Holy Ghost. Yes, yes, yes. We need him in our lives. He said, if you, through the Spirit of God, do mortify the deeds of the body, he says, then you're going to live, Okay. Now listen to this, the flesh and the spirit are always on a collision course with one another. Praise God. With them, there's always a wrestling match going on. Hallelujah. As a kid growing up, my stepfather used to have to, he was to come in the bedroom sometime at night. My brother and I would be in there wrestling or, or doing something and we'd break. Something would fall through the floor and he'd come in there first with that belt in his hand. Boy, he'd be getting ready to put the whooping on us. Wrestling going on. When a wrestling is taking place, somebody is trying to overcome somebody else. Somebody is trying to subdue somebody else. Are y'all hearing me this morning? So when you understand that when the, the flesh and the spirit they're always wrestling against one another. Paul said, but Paul said this, Paul said, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're not wrestling against natural things. We are wrestling against spiritual things, spiritual wickedness in high places, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. My wrestling is not against Sister Tasha. Praise God. The adversary might use Sister Tasha in order to work on something in me that needs to be delivered, but my wrestling is not against her. Amen. Oh, y'all don't hear me today. He said, with them, there's always a wrestling going. There's always a fighting for to have dominion. Do y'all realize that when you sleep, the adversary is scheming to see how he can get dominion in your life? When you were driving here from Navasota at 25 pounds of pressure on them tires, Man, I tell you what, that adversary was working, trying to see how can I, what can I do to, to, to make her either stay home? What can I do to make her either or, or, or delay her, her or to make her get scared? And just, he is fighting for dominion. 
He never, he's, and he's never in agreement with the spirit about how we ought to live our lives. And that's why the flesh must be crucified. It's got to be crucified. Listen, the flesh and the spirit will not live peaceably with one another. Are y'all hearing me today? The, 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 the flesh and the spirit of God will not exist peaceably with one another. It's not going to do it. Listen to this. And we discussed this last Sunday. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. Paul says, For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. <laughs> Woohoo! That's a good one there. The flesh lusted against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary. You know, y'all know what contrary means? This is what? They go against each other. My mother used to always tell me that. And every, I, I think she got it from her dad, my grandpa, because every now and then grandpa would make statements like that. Boy, why are you so contrary? You know how them old folk would <laughs> Well, why you, why you so, he saw, I guess he saw contrary in me even as a little child. <laughs> he saw, my, my, my wife called me Dennis. I think he saw Dennis in me from a little kid growing up. So the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Okay? And these are contrary the one to the other. L to lust means to desire to have something, okay? To lust means to want to crave after, to, to, to want to desire to have something. And what's happening is that the flesh wants to have you. But the spirit is saying, no, it belongs to me. They're both lust they're lusting against one another, claiming ownership, Claiming to, to have dominion in our lives. So that's why they're contrary the one to the other. But what happens when you're led by the, by the flesh, it will not allow you to do the things that you really want to do. Praise God. You've got some folks even today that really, I mean, who have left God, have gone back into the world, and they've entangled themselves in that, in, back into that life. And, and something on the inside is telling them, now you know you need to get back to God. You know you need to get on back to, you know that what you're doing is wrong. But then if, when they begin to look at the things that they're doing in the, in the world and they find themselves so connected and so bound to it that they, they can't seem to, to muster enough faith to end up to make the right decision. They're contrary the one to the other, okay? And it, they, when, the, when the flesh is in control, he doesn't allow you to do the things that you may really want to do. Amen. Long time ago when I got saved, I went to my dad and I would witness to him and try to get him to come to God. And everything I ever told him, he would always say, you're right, you're right. I can't, I can't, I can't dispute that. But when a person is bound, even though they recognize what you're saying, what you're saying is true, when they're really bound, unless they are willing to open up their hearts and surrender to God, they're going to stay bound. Yes. Knowing what the truth is, knowing I shouldn't be doing this, but they, they'll stay bound because the flesh is in control and the flesh, the, the flesh is having dominion in their lives. Are y'all with me? Amen. Now, and I know that, praise God, you guys heard this on, praise God, from, you've heard this, that uh, in, in this particular passage that the flesh was talking about those in the church who, who weren't saved, those who didn't, who were not following the Spirit of God. The Spirit was those in the church who were following the Spirit of God. That's, 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 that's not something that I can prove with the Holy Scriptures, okay? Amen. Are y'all with me? Amen. We're gonna stick with what the Word says. Right. I'm not looking for a new revelation. Amen. Amen. Yes, 
I am not looking for a new revelation. Praise God. He said, the flesh lusted against the spirit. I'm going to leave it just like he said it. The flesh, the carnal mind, the carnal nature of a man wars against, praise God, the influence of God in a man's life. Amen? Amen. Now, that doesn't mean that, and I want to say this, that when you, when you receive the Holy Ghost, when you receive the baptism of God's spirit, at that time, you are saved. At that time, you become a son of God. I want you to hear me. At that time, you become a son of God. Does that, and, and at that time, when you receive his spirit, you are cleaned up. You're, you are purged in the sight of God. Okay, God looks at you just like he looks at, looks at someone who's been saved for 20 years. Yes, he does. Why? Because all God is looking for is his spirit. He's looking for someone who, has, who obeys him to, enough to submit to what his word says. His word says repent, okay, believe the gospel, and you're going to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So if someone has fulfilled that will of God, then God, God, what's the word, bears witness with them. He bears witness to their repentance by filling them with his Holy Ghost. Okay? When, when his spirit comes into us, that's God saying, okay, I agree with you. I am in agreement, I, and I want to become one with you. Okay? I, and I'm going to give you something. I'm going to give you of my, and you guys hear me say this, this all the time, how that God gives us of his DNA. And you're going to, you, when you look in the word of God, every time you see them talking about the seed of God, that word seed in the original Greek is, comes from a word called sperma. That word seed comes from a, the Greek word sperma. S-P-E-R-M-A. And y'all know what sperm is, right? Sperma is, 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 is the seed of God that when that seed is implanted or when that seed is engrafted or when that seed is placed inside of a fertile womb, the heart that, that's hungry for God. Hallelujah. The heart that's, that desires his presence. When God sees that... Listen, how do dogs know other, other dogs? How do a male dog know that a female dog is, is willing to have sex with him? He recognizes that dog is in heat. Amen. And other animals are the same way. A horse don't just go out there and just, just, are y'all, can I say this? Praise God. On every female horse, no, he got to recognize something that that horse gives off and said to let him know I'm fertile. There's something about me that is that is at this time in my in my existence, I'm able to receive your seed and to bring forth fruit. Oh, can y'all hear me today? And God is saying the same thing about us. You ever wonder why some people receive the Holy Ghost just, I mean, just like that, and some people seem like it take years? It is because, it's not because God is, is wanting it to extend it out for anybody else, but there is many times that we have not given God the aroma that we're ready. Mm. Oh, come on, somebody. We have not given him that, that indication that I'm ready. Because we're holding on to things that maybe God is trying to say, let that go. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and many times we'll say, well, I don't know what it could be. If, you, if you're holding on to something, if you're not receiving the spirit of God, and if you've really been seeking, you need to ask him, God, what is it? Show me. Amen. Reveal unto me what it is that's hindering me from receiving of your spirit. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let me get on with this lesson. That's enough, enough anatomy class. That's, that's a, 
Now, I, I'm not no doctor. I'm not, no, I'm not a veterinarian or none of that kind of stuff, okay? <laughs> I can only talk about, what the, about the Spirit of God and God's influence, okay? Amen. There is a difference between sp the sprinkling of water to cleanse the natural flesh, talking about the flesh, and the sprinkling of water to cleanse or to purify the mind or the conscience of a man. Now, why am I going this, de this deep into this lesson? Because I've, like I told you guys on Wednesday night, you need to be able to explain what you hear. Amen. You need to be able to take this word, and as you're meeting people, as you're talking to your families, praise God, you need to be able to explain to them what it means to be born again. You need to be able to explain God godly principles and concepts. It's not just, you know... A, if you ask the, the average person, why do you go to the church that you go to? Why do you attend that particular church? Most of them, of them are going to say, that's where my mama went. That's my family church. Rarely are you going to find the average person that I meet. I, I want to say almost never, Sister Faye, has somebody said, because, man, that, I heard the, the, the word of God was being preached for most people, it's because that's the family church. Who I was raised in it. Y'all ever hear the old cliche, I was born a Baptist, I'm going to die a Baptist? Hallelujah. Listen, I was born a sinner, but I ain't going to die one. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you, can, you can stay in the same mode you was in if you want to. I was born a sinner, but I ain't going to die one. Hallelujah. Let me get on with my lesson. Y'all keep interrupting me. <laughs> difference between sprinkling of the natural water and difference between sprinkling of God's holy water. Okay, one of them was done, can be done by man and the other can be done by God only. Where am I going with that? In the book of Numbers chapter 8. Hallelujah. Numbers chapter 8. The Lord gave this instructions to, uh, amen, to, he said to take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them, okay? Now he gave this and take the Levites from among the children of Israel and cleanse them and thou shalt do unto them and thus rather shalt thou do unto them to cleanse them. This is, this is what you're going to do. He said, I want you to sprinkle water of purifying upon them and let them shave all their flesh and let them wash their clothes and so make themselves clean. Now this is an external cleaning only. This is an external washing only. This is not a purging of the, con of the conscience. This is not a purging of the mind. This is... When I shave, shave all the hair off your body, off your head, your beard, off your legs, under your arms, shave it all. Hallelujah. And then take the, the, the water that has been sanctified and sprinkle that water on them. Make, the, make sure they change their clothes. Praise God. Put on some clean clothes and then I'm going to consider them clean. That's what God, that was his ordinance concerning those Levites, those were the ones who were being selected at that time to operate and to serve as priests to receive the offerings and the sacrifices. And, and they could not serve in, in that office except they had been sanctified themselves. Okay? Now, look at this. In Ezekiel 36, the Lord says this, and I want you to notice a difference. He, this is not something he told someone to do to somebody else. This is his declaration about what he's going to do. Okay? He says, then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean. From all your filthiness and from your, all your idols will I cleanse you. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put where? Where? Where, where's he going to put it? Hallelujah. 
And he says, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. Somebody tell me, what is, what is a stony heart? Hard-hearted. Yes, hard-hearted. Stubborn-hearted. Rebellious. Don't want to listen. Reject instruction. Hard-hearted. God says, I'm going to take that heart out of you, that heart that you've had that caused you to reject my word, that caused you to resist my influence. He said, I'm going to take that heart out of you. Okay? He says, and I'm going to give you a heart of flesh. So what's a heart of flesh, anybody? Mm -mm, not that one. <laughs> That's, it, I hope you have it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking natural. He's not, Sister Tasha? <laughs> yes. Yes. A heart that's sensitive to the will of God. I'm going to take away that heart that every time I told you to do something, you had a reason why you shouldn't. Now I'm going to give you a heart that says that when I give you a command, you'll just say, Yes, Lord, I'll do it. A heart of flesh, something that I can mold, something that I can work with. Praise God. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've ever been on a job or ever had a job or ever was a supervisor on a job and you had to supervise stubborn employees. People you couldn't trust. You're supposed to take a 15-minute break and 40 minutes later, them rascals are still sitting in the lounge. That's a hard heart. Yes, it is. Praise God. And when you write them up, they get mad. <laughs> Hallelujah. Listen to this. Stony heart is not, is not natural, but it's spiritual. And it's a direct reference to rebellious minds. God will give us a mind that will conform to his will without resistance. Somebody say without resistance. Without resistance. Hallelujah. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22, Paul writes this. Paul writes, he says, that you put off concerning the former conversation. Put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So when I'm talking about this new, this, this, this new life in Christ and compared to the old flesh, the old flesh, the old man, he says, put him off. Why? Because he's, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Be renewed, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 22. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. This, the new man, when Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, he's talking about that man who's created in righteousness and true holiness. There's no faking, there's no pretense, there's no, there's no, there's no see something different every time you see him. Amen. Hallelujah. What you see is what you get and what you see is holy. Amen. Can y'all say amen to that? Praise God. Amen. I'm not, you're not slipping and cussing every now and then. Amen, not, nope, not, not, oops, excuse my French. No, that wasn't French. Amen. That was profane. And the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speak it. So if cursing is coming out of my mouth, then it's evident that cursing is in my heart. You can, how y'all say, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip? You can't get something out of something that if it ain't in there from the start. So if cursing is, and fornication, and drinking, and all that, if all that life, all that kind of behavior is coming out of me, then it's evidence that that behavior is in me, and it needs to be what? Crucified. Come on, somebody. It needs to be put to death. It needs, he needs to come under a greater influence, yes. under the influence of the Holy Ghost. Are y'all with me today? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. 
Pray God. Paul said this in Romans chapter 12. Paul said that we should be transformed by the renewing of our what? By the renewing of our minds. Praise God. We need a, we need a mind tr transplant. Amen? Yeah. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Is this all right? Praise God. Yeah. Sister Tasha, thank you for this question. Man, I, I'll tell you, I couldn't, I couldn't get this off my mind from the, from the time that you asked it. Let's leave this one. The flesh, in the spiritual sense, is a function of the mind and is governed by in, impulses generated from within and driven to satisfy our customized sensual cravings. Customized. What Sister Gertrude is craving after may not be what I'm craving after. Amen. What Cordell is craving after may not be what I'm craving after. Amen. Every man's situation is customized to his own likings, to his own desires. Are y'all hearing me? And these impulses are not generated from outside of me. They're generated from within. A man is tempted when he's drawn away of his what? Own lust. I'm not tempted when I'm drawn away of Sean lust. Amen. Amen. Sean like yay yays. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah. But an impulse is something that even though it's involuntary, it'll drive someone toward doing a certain thing. It'll keep nagging them. It'll keep nagging them. Go get, go get you a drink. Go, go get you a drink. They made you mad. Go get you a drink. They made you mad. She don't want to act right. Go get somebody else. Huh? He don't want to act right? Go find you somebody else. Huh? And it's, and it's especially bad if that's the way you used to handle your business. He wants to bring you right back to what he think is familiar to you. Come on, somebody. For the, and for the unsaved, for the unsaved, those who don't have the spirit of God, they are powerless to defend themselves against these impulses. And they cannot resist yielding their members as members of unrighteousness. Hallelujah. They got a case of the can't help it. Can't help it. They, re they may regret what they did later on, but they couldn't help it. Powerless, man. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Is this all right today? Listen, the flesh... And I'm talking about both, both contexts, both in the mind and of the body, okay? The flesh can be brought into obedience when the spirit of the Lord is in total control, when it is no longer I, but when it's Christ that lives in me. Amen. Are y'all hearing me today? I can't, I, I, can't, I can't make the excuse like Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me. The devil made me buy this dress. Okay? I can bring this flesh into subjection. I can bring this flesh into obedience. Whenever the spirit of the Lord is in total control. Are y'all hearing me today? Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. Listen to, this is what Paul said. Paul said this. Paul said, but I keep under my body. Okay, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, that I myself should be a castaway. Okay, now, I was just kind of curious. I said, I wonder what this, what this keep under means in the Greek. I was just kind of curious. I keep under my body. Do y'all know what to keep under your body means? Just give me a... Any, whatever your idea might be. I'm sorry? Keep it hit. Keep it hit. Okay. Anybody else? 
I'm sorry? To control? Okay. Come on, somebody else. I keep under my body. I keep under my body. When, when I look at that in the original Greek, that keep under means to beat something so severely, so aggressively, as to where it turns black and blue. And that's a beating, ain't it? Especially for black people. Some of y'all may not turn black and blue so easily. But he's indicating in this passage the severity, how badly. In one, in one part of that, of that definition, it means to wear one out. Look it up. I told you guys a month ago, two months ago, get you a Strong's Concordance. Get you a concordance, learn how to use it. It'll help you in learning uh, the, 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 what these scriptures mean, what these words mean. He said, I keep under my, in other words, every time he step out of line, I'm putting a whooping on him. That's what he's saying. He said, I'm gonna, and I'm going to leave a mark that he's not going to quickly forget. He's going to remember it. Hallelujah. That's what he means. He said, I, this body, he said, this old body, this body of mine, this old man, this carnal mind, I'm going to get, he said, to, talking about to discipline something, okay? He said, I'm going to keep under my body and bring it into subjection. And he's, then he goes on to explain why it is important to give it that kind of a discipline. He said, because I'm up here preaching to all y'all. I'm telling you how to live. I'm in a place telling you what, what's, God, what's God's will and what's not, what's right and wrong, how we ought to, to, to carry ourselves, okay? He said, and, and for me, I've got to make sure that I'm the first one who's abiding by what I teach. I've got to make sure that I'm practicing what I preach. He said, and the only way to make sure of that is to every time I, even if somebody might say, yeah, but that wasn't so bad what you did. Yeah, as far as I'm concerned, it was very bad. And I treat it as that was very bad. And you may look at it as, oh, that was just a minor offense. Listen, you can't find minor offense in God. Are you hearing me? The Bible says that all unrighteousness is sin. He doesn't say there's a, a, a minor offense, righteousness, and a serious offense. Fornication, praise God, lying, whatever, deceitfulness, holding a, they're all in the same basket as unrighteous as far as God is concerned. Are y'all hearing me right now? Praise God. Oh, Jesus. He says that it, I want to make sure that if I'm preaching to you, that I'm not the one that's being cast away. To be cast away means to be rejected by God. Cast away means to be not approved by God. Cast away means that you failed the test. Hallelujah. Crucifying the flesh. Listen to this, and I know this is the part of the message where y'all don't, don't like this part. But crucifying the flesh will always involve some sort of suffering. Nobody gets excited about the suffering part. Oh, freedom, freedom. Ooh. But you got to suffer. Oh. We don't want to suffer. Nobody, want, nobody invites suffering. But if we're going to grow in God, there is going to be some suffering that we have got to endure. As a matter of fact, what did Paul say? Paul told Timothy, he says, endure hardness as a good soldier of the Lord. He said, and don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Are y'all hearing me today? Hallelujah. Every one of us if we're going to crucify the flesh, it's going to involve some sort of suffering. And he says, therefore, as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, 
Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in his flesh has ceased from sin. Amen. Praise God. Now, Christ suffered for us both in his natural flesh as well as in the realm of his mind. You say, well, well I, we know he hung on the cross. We know he suffered in that flesh. We know they beat him. We know they pierced his side. But when did he suffer in his mind? In that garden of Gethsemane. In his, in his mind. His, he was being tempted. He had to end up praying, praying three times. Father, if it be possible, take this cup from me. He was suffering in the realm of his mind. There was nobody in the garden beating him. But in his own mind, in his own inner man, in his own inner spirit, he was wrestling with the decision on whether to do God's, whether to go all the way or not. Can y'all can y'all hear that? Amen. He says, but he says, nevertheless, not my will. See, this is what suffering in the flesh. When he says, he that suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. When you go through something like that, and you come out of it saying, nevertheless. Not my will, but let thy will be done. Then you're able, then you're at a place where you, you can cease from sinning. Amen. I, never heard, I never heard anybody say I could live without sin. I am telling you today that if God is in control, total control of your life, you can live without sinning. And I'm, going to, and I'm going to qualify that by asking you a question. Since you think that you've got to sin a little bit to live, tell me which sin you've got to commit to live. Amen. Show me in the Bible. This is, show me in the Bible for all of those people who, who don't believe that Jesus, Matthew 5 and verse 48, Jesus said, be ye therefore perfect, even as my father in heaven is also perfect. So since people don't believe that they can live a life that's blameless in the sight of God, tell me, somebody, please, what sin do I have to commit in order to live? Do I have to commit fornication? Uh -uh. Do I have to lie? Do I have to steal? Oh, <laughs> What, do I, what sin do I have to do? You see, we need to understand what the word sanctified means. Sanctified is not, and coming up as a little kid in a little Baptist church, we thought the sanctified church was drums and tambourines and guitars because we didn't have no guitars at our church. That's a sanctified church over there. Oh, them folks sure make a lot of noise at that sanctified church. Don't realize that every house open in the name of Jesus ought to be a sanctified church. Every church open in his name ought to be a sanctified church. Hallelujah. I told you earlier that when you're born of God, Praise God, you are saved just like the 20-year, 30-year veteran. Amen. But you've got to go through some things. You've got to, there's, there's, a, there's a learning curve. That's, what, that's a good way to put it. There's a learning curve. When you get saved, it doesn't, you don't know anything. Okay? And Peter begins to say that. He says, now, he says, you, you're coming into God. He says, you need to be desiring the sincere milk of the word Amen. that you might grow thereby. God's going to allow circumstances that are going to challenge you. God's going to allow situations where the adversary is going to come to you and say, now see, now, just like he told me, he said, now, if you were saved, you wouldn't have done that. And his, his idea all along was to try to get me discouraged enough to quit, to quit God. Amen. Hallelujah. There's, there's, there's learning. I'm a son. From the time that I receive his seed, from the time that his seed, his seed is conceived in me and brings forth this, this child, 
I am his son. Hallelujah. Praise God. But I don't know anything. I don't, I don't know anything. I, I, haven't, I haven't experienced a lot of things. So God will give us many times time to grow into him, to grow into perfection, to grow, to increase. Are y'all hearing me today? Now that's not giving anybody an excuse to continue in sin. That's not giving anybody an excuse to continue in ignorance or to continue in lack of knowledge. Because Luke writes in the book of Hebrew, Luke said, Luke said, for when the time when you ought to be teachers, he said, you have need that others have to keep continue to teach you. He said, what he's saying is that there should come a point in time in every one of our salvations that we grow, we grow to the place that we're able to teach others. And he began to rebuke the, the church because they had not grown to the place that when the time when you ought to be teachers, he said, you, you, having, you keep going around the elementary stuff. You keep going around the same old foundation stuff. And, 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 you, and you're never getting past your ABCs. Are y'all with me today? Who wants to get past their ABCs? I want to get past the ABCs, y'all. I do. I don't want to keep learn. I don't want to keep coming to school every year and be going back over. But I've been. Didn't we cover this lesson last year? Didn't we cover this lesson six months ago? Can I can I learn something new? Hallelujah! Praise God! Christ suffered for us both in His natural flesh and in the realm of His mind. Okay, our sufferings may sometimes be in the natural flesh also. Jesus told the people who followed him, he said, you're going to be hated above all nations for my name's sake. He said, some of you are going to be killed. Some of you are going to be cast into prison, talking about suffering in their natural flesh. Okay? And what we have to understand is that these sufferings in the natural flesh are going to cause something in your mind to examine what's going on. Amen. Praise God. Your husband or your spouse says, I don't want to live with you no more because all you want to do is talk about Jesus. Then what you going to do? You going to stop talking about Jesus? Or yes, people do it. You know why? Because they're not, they're not willing to suffer in the flesh. They're not willing to suffer in the flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. They're not willing to allow that flesh to be crucified. They don't realize that there's something greater. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey. On the other side of their sufferings. Yes. Are y'all hearing me today? Yes. Glory to God. Oh, Lord. Look at this. But crucifying the flesh will also produce God's glory in us. Hallelujah. If we totally surrender and allow the flesh to die. Y'all need to understand that God's glory will not be revealed in us if we're not willing to suffer. Amen. And I'm not talking about suffering because I did wrong. I'm talking about suffering because I'm doing right. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul said, for I reckon. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Boy, I tell you, Paul was a, Paul was a character, wasn't he? Uh, Paul was, a, now this guy getting beaten, whooped with <laughs> stripes, left shipwrecked for dead, thrown in prison. And he say, he's saying that I reckon. In other words, I've looked at and I've examined all of these things that I've gone through. And I have come to this conclusion. He said, that the, whatever I'm suffering of the, in this present time is not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, how many of us can say that, praise God? We ought to be able to say it. 
You know why? Especially given the fact, how many of you have been thrown in jail for preaching the gospel? How many of you have had guns drawn on you for preaching the gospel? How many of us have had, have had, I mean, have literally had family members to leave, pack their bags and leave because you wanted to live right? Hallelujah. So, so we can't really imagine the things that Paul endured. Paul said in one place, as he's writing to the church at Philippi, Paul wrote there, he said, he said, all the things that I enjoyed in the world, all the pleasures that this world that I that I had in this life, he said, I counted them all but dung. Did y'all hear that? So I counted them all but dung that I might win Christ. Praise God. Hallelujah. You got people that go to Vegas and 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 and, and spend a thousand dollars to win twenty. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. They just keep playing that slot machine. Cha -ching. Just keep feeding that machine. Cha -ching, cha -ching, cha -ching. I'm going to win sooner or later. And they're not even worried about what they've already invested, but they've already lost. They get that $20 worth of nickels or quarters. Boy, they're so happy. Oh, I hit the jackpot. Oh, I hit the jackpot. <laughs> and they're not even considering what they spent to get that back. Listen, the house always wins. Don't y'all realize that? Y'all don't go, don't go, don't go gambling. Amen. The house is gonna always win. Yes. <laughs> so it is in the kingdom of God. Don't go out there gambling with. Don't be out there playing no game with the devil. I win this time. Roll, rolling them dice. Rolling them dice. <laughs> I'm going to beat you this time. No, sir. Leave that rascal alone. You hear me? Right, <laughs> you, are, you are not going to win. Praise God. He's been doing this for a long, long time. <laughs> oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What do we say here? It's going to also produce God's glory if we, if we uh, surrender to God. Verses 16 and 17 of this same Romans chapter 8. Y'all need to read Romans chapter 8, man. That is one of the most powerful chapters, one of the most, po most powerful chapters in the whole Bible as far as I'm concerned, especially for the new believer, for the Christian. He said in verses 16, he says, the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. There's a witness on the inside of me. Hallelujah. That every time I hear the word of God, that, that, that witness is saying, amen. Hallelujah. That witness is saying, boy, ain't that right. That witness is saying, say, say it again. <laughs> so I'll say it again. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The Spirit of God is going to bear witness with the Spirit that's on the inside of you. There's a connection that's taking place. Now, if we're not the children of God, then the connection has been broken on somebody. You guys were back there warming up those warmers the other day. Oh, Praise he God. Said, the Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. I'm almost done. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. And then he adds a caveat. He says, if so be, I'm a joint heir with Christ. He said, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Now, ain't that good news? The, the, hallelujah. Glory, the, the glory of God is worth whatever suffering that I may be enduring. Hallelujah. Listen, when Alabama wins the college football national championship this year, I know y'all was pulling for them Aggies. <laughs> when Alabama wins the national championship this year, more people are going to celebrate than the quarterback. 
He's not going to be the only one celebrating. That whole team is going to celebrate. The coaching staff is going to celebrate. The wide receivers, the linemen, everybody that participated and had a part with that team, they're going to celebrate. This is what he's saying in this, in this, in this scripture. He says, when he's talking about being glorified together, it means that it's not just going to be God glory. We're going to be glorified with him. Oh, man, I figured y'all would all jump up and run down this aisle when I said that. We're going, to re we're going to be glorified together with him. He's not going to be the only one happy and rejoicing. We're going to be rejoicing also. Why? Because we have endured the hardness, and now we won the game, and the championship is ours. Come on, somebody. If you're more than a conqueror, praise God. I said, I'm more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. I said, I'm more than a conqueror. It's not because of my name or, what, or any, any education that I've got. I am more than a conqueror because of what he has invested in me. Hallelujah. Oh, I wish y'all could hear me today. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, let me get finished. Let y'all go on, eat y'all eat y'all greens. Praise God. <laughs> Sister Gertrude, you are green cooking something, boy. I've been eating greens all my life, I tell you. You are greens cooking something. God bless your green cooking hands. <laughs> Hallelujah. Last scripture. He says, Paul said this. Paul said, for though we war in the flesh, walk in the flesh, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He's, he's using... The comparison there between we're walking in a natural flesh. Yes, we're still human beings. We're still humans. I still got this skin covering my, covering my membranes. He says, but I'm not using that or anything in this natural body to do warfare against the devil. Are y'all with me? He said, why? Because the weapons of our warfare, they are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare, they're not natural. A Smith and Western is not the weapon of God's choice. Right. Are y'all hearing me today? A switchblade is not the weapon of God's choice. Amen. Hallelujah. 